Hey everyone, thanks for joining to listen to our talk, which will be about how to analyze gaming data using Google Cloud. I will cover the theory behind some of the Google Cloud products and services, and I'll then hand over to Luke from Improbable, who will talk about what they've built in terms of real world data analytics pipelines. This solution that they built has also been open source, so you can go check it out afterwards. In an era of free to play and online multiplayer games, data has become crucial to understanding and improving your game. The ability to collect, analyze, and derive insights from data has effects across the entire value chain of your game. And this is everything from being able to create better game levels through play testing using AIs that have been trained on the behavior of real world gamers to improving monetization outcomes through better customer segmentation and tailored offers. Organizations also want to be able to share data across the different units, from the game developers to the marketing teams, and this needs to be done in a secure manner. Data is typically stored in a data warehouse. However, talking to various teams in the industry, we've discovered that they struggle to achieve their goals of analyzing the gaming events and data that you collect. This is mainly due to challenges around the scalability and cost of legacy data warehouse solutions. For example, those solutions struggle to handle the exponential growth of data that we're seeing in the industry. It's also more and more difficult to integrate between the various external sources that you pull from. And with more and more games moving to real-time telemetry feeds, being able to analyze, ingest, and process those becomes even harder. So really the question is, is there a platform out there that can scale to the needs of your game? Hey everyone, my name is Olivier Van Gotten and I work at Google Cloud as a customer engineer. We'll now dig a bit deeper into the topic of data analytics and look at one of our key products in this area. And that product is BigQuery, our cloud native data warehouse. BigQuery is fully managed and serverless and offers everything that you'd expect from a data warehouse. It also has key unique capabilities, such as the ability to ingest and analyze real-time streaming data. BigQuery also has a high-speed in-memory cache, which we call BI Engine, for faster reporting and analysis using tools such as Tableau. Security is also very important for us and our customers. That is why all data is encrypted at rest by default. However, one of the most exciting capabilities of BigQuery is its built-in machine learning training and prediction capabilities. Let's have a look at those. So BigQuery ML enables data analysts to build and deploy machine learning models on massive data sets directly inside BigQuery using just the power of SQL. BigQuery ML has the capability of addressing various use cases. For example, you're able to segment customers using k-means clustering models. You can determine a player's lifetime value using linear regression. And you can definitely create more funky complex use cases by training an external TensorFlow model somewhere and directly importing that into BigQuery and making use of it to predict using BigQuery ML and SQL. So let's have a look in practice. So let's imagine a table in BigQuery that contains game of purchase and playing time data. Here, we've aggregated these data points to have a single row per user ID that contains values for their total number of game purchases and total hours of playing time. We've been asked by the marketing team to segment these users so that we can identify our most valuable customers. To do this, I can use BigQuery ML's k-means clustering model, all done again using just a simple SQL statement. I configure the model to segment our user base into four categories, and then I pass in the data from the table that I was showing previously. Once the model has been trained, I can check the model evaluation to validate its output. BigQuery ML automatically splits the data we feed into the training step, such that 80% is used to train our model and 20% is used to test it. Here, we can see that we've identified the key characteristics for our four segments. So for example, we're gonna have our first group that purchase a few games, but play a lot of them we see a group of people who purchase a lot of games and then play a lot of those games. Then we have a group who just dabble in video games, purchase very few games and also play them very little. And then the final group, which is the one that I probably belong in, which is I buy a lot of games during sales and never play them at all. 
BigQuery is only one piece of Google Cloud Smart Analytics platform. Google's platform enables you to build much broader data pipelines by connecting, analyzing, and visualizing your data across your applications and systems. This means we bring you the best of Google in our solutions, and we can help you create a more innovative and collaborative culture in your organization. The Google Cloud Analytics platform can also be combined with compute services to build out a full-blown gaming architecture. For example, you can use App Engine and Firestore to manage user profiles and handle logins and logouts. You can also use Kubernetes Engine to host a matchmaking service and your game servers. And finally, you can, from those systems above, send all of the events and telemetry directly into BigQuery for analysis. As I mentioned, for a real world example, I'm now going to hand over to Luke, who will talk about what they are doing at Improbable. Hi, guys. Um, so as Ollie just said, I'm Luke. I'm a data scientist at Improbable. So first, a little bit about us, who we are, and what we do. Uh, we provide better ways to make multiplayer games and help multiplayer developers uh, meet any challenge. So how do we do that? We've got several services, some of which include, for instance, managed hosting and orchestration of your game servers. We also have networking products that could uh, allow you to combine multiple game engines. You can do more than what a single engine can currently do. We've got online services such as analytics, and I'm going to be talking about that one in particular today. And then we set up other development tools as well as everything from advice and support to full co-development of your game. Finally, we now also have three internal game studios that are building multiplayer games using the services and products that I just outlined. And our first internal game called Scavengers is going to be out there this year, so keep an eye for that one. So the analytics pipeline, um, what is it and why did we build it? When out in the field talking to uh, game studios, we kind of noticed that there wasn't an easy way for them to quickly get going with analytics. Um, so we kind of set out to solve that by providing a reference architecture that is just like a deploying your own cloud model so it quickly could get going with analytics. And one of the key tenets that we kept in the back of our heads was that we wanted to give data like studios full access um, of their own data without any form of lock-in. So the, the key principle is you just deploy this in your own cloud. All the data comes into your own cloud hosting, in your own kind of like blob storage. And as of that point, you can then decide to do whatever you want specifically with it, which could be, for instance, using an off-the-shelf live ops or game analytics provider. But you still have the flexibility then to on live data also utilize any of the ML or AI tools provided by uh, Google Cloud in this case. So why uh, Google Cloud? Um, they provide highly scalable analytics. For instance, uh, you can process millions of events per second with pops up and data flow. Um, they're very easy to use. So and a problem where big use of Kubernetes and you kind of have this first class Kubernetes experience when developing on Google Cloud. They're also fully supported by Terraform, which is our DevOps templating language of choice. And they've got great documentation for all the bricks that they provide. Um, also with like example code snippets in various languages. So if you kind of want to prototype something quickly, you can just copy paste those, get it to work. And then if you think there's something there, you can afterwards then make the code your own. Um, and then in particular for analytics, they've got a great stack of uh, AI and machine learning tools. So like Ollie just outlined before, BigQuery ML, but if you have um, many models that you want to train and deploy in production, you can use the AI platform for that, for instance. So ingesting data using the analytics pipeline, uh, the big picture is as follows. On the left-hand side, we have things that emit events. They could be PCs, consoles, mobile devices, game events from other sources, systems, or whatnot. Those post or send all their events to the analytics pipeline. And the goal of the analytics pipeline is just to capture and persist and organize all of that data in your own cloud hosting. Um, and that then kind of makes it ready to be used by any other service in the future, such as cloud data prep to like prepare for machine learning models, BigQuery, ML, uh, Cloud Auto, well, et cetera, or just to like analyze um, that data with BigQuery and feed it into reporting systems like Tableau, Looker, et cetera. So the architecture starts with events. There are JSON events that are posted to a REST API. That is a, a, a Python 3 application adhering to the Flask programming model. Um, it is deployed on Kubernetes engine. So that means that if your demand or like, yeah, the, the, the influx of events kind of enhances, Kubernetes can auto scale copies of that um, like application like to however, however much it needs to, to meet those requirements. So it's kind of like horizontally scalable. Um, when those events arrive, it kind of augments them a little bit, which, for instance, a receive timestamp, and then writes new line delimited JSON in blob storage. 
So once all your data is neatly aggregated um, in that blob storage bucket, you're kind of done because you can then use BigQuery to actually query data that's inside of that bucket in a federated way. Federated means that you, kind of the data doesn't live inside of BigQuery, but somewhere else. But you can still use SQL statements on top of data that is in New Line Delimited JSON in cloud storage. Um, over time, you might notice that, OK, I actually have a lot of events coming in. Each post request becomes a file in, in cloud storage. So my queries are slowing down because I have so many files. So the first way you can solve for that is by using a, a cloud function that basically gets invoked whenever a file hits this bucket. Uh, the function gets invoked. It takes the contents of that file from blob storage and then writes it into native BigQuery storage. So at that point, if you then query those like tables that are in native storage, all your queries kind of benefit from the native performance of BigQuery, so everything will be super fast again. Um, another way, which isn't in the open source repo, but we've added ourselves when load testing this, is to add in a batch job. So we've used Dataflow for this that comes in every hour and picks up all the latest small files in the first bucket and then aggregates them into a second final resting place, where we then have far fewer but much larger files. And if you then query those in a federated way with BigQuery, everything will become much quicker again. So um, we have successfully scaled this infrastructure to 10,000 requests per second um, at an average of one server or client request per 30 seconds, which is something that you can tweak yourself based on your capacity and peak CCU. This would support a peak CCU of about 300,000. Um, we also tested this with an average payload of 10 events per request. So this would equal 8.6 billion events per day. So there's two caveats when using this at scale. One is you probably really want to use a similar batching setup as we have. And uh, the second is, in order to further optimize this, we add a caching layer at the endpoint so that not each post request becomes a file, but like every 10 seconds, it flushes out all the post requests in a single file in cloud storage. So what are some of the strengths um, of this setup? So as I outlined, it's designed in a modular way to handle evolving business needs. It's super simple to start. You just start with an endpoint and that writes files into cloud storage. Um, you then, if your demand like over time enhances because you run more play tests or you have more players, you could, for instance, use the cloud function to hop all of those events over into native BigQuery storage, or you can add like a batching step like we did to like concatenate these files into fewer but larger ones. Um, you have a flexible and custom REST endpoint as an entry point, which is set up to handle, for instance, any event schema or source. So what we've done is we've got a um, PlayFab event schema parser and just one for our own um, own like event schema, and as events come in, it just figures out which parser to use and then write everything in like the same format in cloud storage. Um, we also prefer, preserve flexibility where possible. So we use new line limited JSON and blob storage, like that's really like key. And we've got uh, Kubernetes and Docker, for instance, utilized where possible. We've used a single language, Python 3, which is very popular within the data community. It will also help like if you've got data analysts that are kind of engineering savvy, they can also then look at the pipeline code and understand what's going on. So that's great. Um, it's affordable. Like, because this is a deploying your own cloud kind of delivery model, you avoid any margin that comes with an off-the-shelf solution. So what are some of the opportunities that we still have? Um, we could reduce the maintenance overhead by deploying the endpoint, for instance, serverless on Knative or Cloud Run. Um, this way, you don't have to manage your own Kubernetes cluster and have the overhead associated with that. You could also use the endpoint to forward events to a messaging queue, for instance. So you add a method. So instead of a v1 event, which goes into cloud storage, you do like v1 stream, and it goes either to Kafka or PubSub. And then you can use that as a source for, for instance, a data flow streaming uh, job that can keep a rolling count of, say, kills. And if that spikes or surges, then you can trigger a blood moon in your world. Um, so that kind of then enables this, this interplay between what the players do in your ecosystem and how the ecosystem responds to that on a, on a higher level. So what are some of the weaknesses of this setup is that it does require a data engineering capacity to maintain. There is some complexity. This is not a fully managed service. The endpoint will definitely benefit if you would port it over to a language like Go, but at the cost then, again, of interpretability for some of the data folks out there. Uh, at high scale, you will have a large number of small files in cloud storage that will then disable the live external storage functionality. So at that point, you should either use a cloud function at the batching step or at the caching layer in order to like, solve for that. So threats, we've got an ever-evolving data landscape. So with new things that come out, um, those might challenge the, some of the decisions that we've made uh, with this infrastructure. So what are some of the lessons learned? Um, one of the things that we have right now is our own kind of event schema. So on the wire, when you send these JSON events, what is inside of each event? Um, I'm not going to list all of these out one by one. You can look at the slides later and like figure out uh, what each means. But one thing that I wanted to 
do explain is that we've kind of identified these as the only keys that can be at the top level of your dictionary. Anything else would go into event attributes. So for instance, if it's a match start event, the match ID would sit inside of event attributes. But by always having only these kind of keys at the root level, you can safely unpack these, for instance, in your first table in the data warehouse when you ingest that somewhere. And that will dramatically kind of like simplify the ingestion um, frameworks that you will have to use if you want to move that data ongoingly in the data warehouse. So about instrumentation, um, automatically enrich it incoming events were possible. So um, capture things like the event timestamp, the event index, all automatically only requiring a developer to pass in what is unique to that particular event. Um, batch your events, don't send single events. Like um, if you can always batch them up and then at what rate you can flush those out is informed by the, on the one hand, the capacity you've provisioned for in terms of requests per second versus the number of peak CC that you expect. You can kind of then model out, okay, well then I, I can at most flush X amount of times per second. Um, keep a local cache on the client side in case of connectivity disruptions, then write them to a file, and then whenever the connection is reestablished, you can flush everything out. Make your ingestion endpoint configurable. So for instance, which host headers or query strings to use for uh, this particular post request. Um, in particular, the endpoint reads the query parameters, or many of them, and they kind of co-determine the ultimate file path that the file is stored in into the cloud storage. So you can then basically already organize and filter out certain event types and put them in like neatly structured folders in cloud storage. And this can have like beneficial downstream effects because then I could um, write, for instance, all my frames per second event to a particular directory only containing such events. And then I can aggregate those before I write them into BigQuery, for instance, in the DIM table. So we're using an HTTP endpoint, so it's always good to have retries with exponential back off. If you don't get a 200 code back, just like wait a, like a particular period and then try again. Some of the tips and tricks that we picked up on as well when actually utilizing this data is that um, you can import a Google spreadsheet as a live BigQuery table. Uh, live meaning if I make change to the spreadsheet, they're instantly visible in BigQuery as well. Um, and that could be great, for instance, if you've got item ID to item name mapping uh, tables. Then vice versa, you can also run BigQuery queries within Google Spreadsheets, and the result of that becomes a spreadsheet as well. Um, so this is a great way for, uh, for instance, business analysts to still use production data in BigQuery, but in a spreadsheeting like system that they are familiar with. You should also check out the BigQuery JSON functions to extract data out of event attributes. Um, don't use any of the string lookup functions, just use those functions, because then you can just give it a parsing path and cleanly and exactly like parse the JSON in however you want. Um, also avoid non-alphabetic characters in JSON keys, because that will trip up the federated query mechanism that I outlined earlier. So then finally, um, we use dbt to manage and source control all of our SQL code and to document everything as well. Um, dbt kind of out of the box uh, makes every query a model and then you reference other models, which means the entire like lineage graph or linear system is preserved with dbt and visible, which is very nice for maintaining all of these queries. Um, and also if you use the schema.yaml file, you can generate docs um, just like out of the box and that will really allow new data analysts that are like, just coming in and they need to get to know your schema really well, it will really help them to have that as a resource to figure out how to like run the queries, what to query, which tables to look at it, et cetera. Then finally, you should also definitely adopt a GDPR strategy. So um, two examples, but it's really up to you ultimately what how you want to like approach this. But one could be you add a method to the endpoint and then you route all your events that contain personal identifiable information only to your data warehouse. So you avoid blob storage because at that point, all of that like data that is sensitive is in a SQL kind of like uh, ecosystem. So you can run like select star for exports and delete from for uh, any forget me kind of requests. Um, alternatively, if you use the batching setup, what you could do is um, you set a retention policy on the first bucket for like four to eight weeks. And then when the batching stop comes in, for instance, with data flow, you have the data in memory again, and that's where you can then do any scrubbing or anonymization of that data before you then move it over into its final resting place. Um, but then you can kind of like cope with it like that. So that is everything. Thanks for watching the video. Uh, I hope you found it informative. And if you have any questions about it or suggestions, then yeah, feel free to uh, go to our website, find out the, the forms, leave a question there, or find me on LinkedIn and just like ping me a message and I will get back to you.